and welcome to another episode of the Enter the Bible podcast, where you can get answers or at least reflections on everything you wanted to know about the Bible, but were afraid to ask. I'm Katie Langston. And I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And our special guest today is Nicholas Shazer. He's the Assistant Professor of Religious Studies uh, at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota, not too far from Luther Seminary, uh, with a special emphasis on biblical uh, studies and Jewish studies. So welcome, Nick. Thank you for being with us again today. Thanks uh, for having me. Yeah, great to have you. Uh, just to note, uh, Nick has a uh, book coming out with SBL Press called A Ransom for Israel, Jesus' Exile and Jewish Salvation in the Gospel of Matthew. So a book uh, specifically on the Gospel of Matthew. Um, so we uh, invited you uh, here today, Nick, to uh, to address a question uh that a listener submitted on the Enter the Bible website. And as always, listeners, if you want to submit a question, just go to enterthebible.org and we will get to as many as we can. So uh, it's it's a bit of a lengthy question, but it's, I think, worth reading the whole thing just to understand what the, the uh, uh, person who submitted it is asking. So here's the question. Hi, I'm a teenager who would like some advice and guidance on my question. How is it possible to take the Bible figuratively or metaphorically, but also believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead. I've been struggling to understand what I believe, and this has been a roadblock in my faith. I don't think the story of Jonah is 100% literal, but does carry symbolic significance and meaning. But I do believe Jesus rose again and is God. How do we know what is literal versus figurative in the Bible? So it's a really good question. Uh, it's a big question, and it's a good I question. I love that question. Yeah. It's a wonderful yeah, yeah. question. Um, yeah, so, and it yeah, it has yeah. to do not just, of course, with Jonah or with the resurrection, but but basically, how do we read scripture? But mm -hmm. go ahead, Nick. How would you address? Absolutely, yeah, right. So you know, it, it's not always easy to ascertain exactly how we should be reading something. You know, there's different genres in biblical reading and interpretation. So you get something like the Psalms, which are prayers and poetry. I mean, that sh probably shouldn't be interpreted exactly the same way as say. The book of Judges, you know, which is narrative, and uh, and so it, it can be tricky. And uh, oftentimes, what we're doing is just doing our best to come up with evidence for our for our different interpretations. Uh, when it comes to Jonah, I'll do this probably as briefly as I can. Jonah <laughs> is an actual prophet in the historical literature in the Deuteronomistic history in the Bible. And what happens with the book of Jonah, as we know it, the very short four-chapter text on Jonah and the Ninevites, etc., is that the author of that text is writing at a what's called a post-exilic time. So that is after the Babylonian exile, which is in 586 BCE. So uh, the author is taking Jonah, the figure, right, the prophet, and building a narrative around Jonah. And, you know, the question had something to do with, I don't take everything 100% literally in Jonah. That's perfectly fine. Uh, Jonah is, um, Jonah is, is uh, it's, it's pretty clear that it's supposed to be comedic. Uh, yeah. and, and Jonah kind of does the opposite of every good prophet that we have. So Jonah is <laughs> kind of like a negative foil. Like if you want to be a good prophet, kind of don't be like Jonah. Uh, but there's a lot of narrative repetition in Jonah. There's a lot of important stuff. One of those things is the number three. Uh, particularly in the Greek version of Jonah, which is uh, called the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. Um, this number three shows up all the time. And one of the three numbers is um, Jonah being in the belly of a big fish, a dog gadol in Hebrew, not a whale, by the way, uh, being in the belly of a big fish for three days and three nights and then vomited up onto the dry land. Now, the issue here is vis-a-vis -vis Jesus' resurrection is that Jesus himself in Matthew 12, 40 says that just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so too is the son of man, that's Jesus, going to be in the heart of the earth for days and three nights. So that is Jesus links his experience of death, uh, being in the grave, and then being raised from the dead by God. Jesus links that to the event of Jonah. So what do we do, right? If we don't take Jonah 100% literally, and I'm, I'm actually on board with, with that, I think that the Hebrew text compels us actually towards that. I think it's actually a, a, a sound uh, biblical conclusion as opposed to like, you know, 
being, you know, just dropping the Bible wholesale or saying that didn't happen historically or this didn't happen. No, I think that the literature itself pushes us to the idea that we should be taking Jonah in a different way, okay, than right. fully historically. That said, what do we do with Jesus? Does that mean that with Jesus' resurrection, we also have to take that ahistorically or metaphorically or literarily? Like, what do we do? Well, it's very clear that the Gospels take Jesus' resurrection as an embodied, physical, historical event. There's just no way around that. This is not some, uh, you know, sort of abstract kind of thing where we saw a vision, but we weren't really sure what we saw. And, right. you know, Jesus was raised from the dead in our hearts or something like that. Right. Uh, no, no, no. Jesus is, is literally <laughs> raised from the dead. You know, the stone is rolled away. He's gone. He's out of his tomb. And then he appears to his disciples, depending on, again, depending on the, um, the resurrection narrative in the gospels that you're reading. But an important thing to note is that this body that Jesus gets uh, in, his, in his raised state is physical. It is his body in many ways, and it's something else. So, for example, uh, if you remember on the road to Emmaus, Jesus, this is Luke chapter 24. It's the last yep. chapter of Luke. And he meets two on the road to Emmaus, and it says they don't recognize him. Mm -hmm. uh, why? Well, it's not just because they're thick, it's because <laughs> Jesus' body is a resurrection body, or as Paul will talk about in 1 Corinthians 15, a spirit body. I'll get back to that in a second. So Jesus, you know, can sit down in Luke and eat with his disciples and right. break bread. He's, he's chewing. He's, he's, yeah. he's, yeah, in, right, they exactly. Touch him. That's right. So this is the gospel of John. So John chapter 20, he makes a fish breakfast. They're sitting down. He's eating it. He's swallowing the food. He says to doubting Thomas, you know, touch my side, touch my hands. This is his body and it's physical. At the same time in John, he he walks through walls. Right. He appears in a room that's locked and he just appears. So the body is is uh, physical, if you want. Yeah, meaning when I say physical, I mean we've got – it's an entity embodied in space and time. Yeah? But it's not made of of uh, the flesh and blood, the, the, the kind of – to go back to Paul, this is um, 1 Corinthians 15. By the way, this is like the best distillation that we have in the New Testament of this idea of resurrection and having a resurrection body. Paul says things like, well, when God's kingdom comes to earth and we're all raised from the dead bodily, we'll get a new body. Um, he says that those who aren't dead will just be changed in the twinkling of an eye and there'll be a trumpet blast, which in it's the Greek translation of the, sh the word shofar in Hebrew, which is a ram's horn. This goes back to all sorts of biblical precedents. But Paul envisions the pe people being physically and bodily raised from the dead. That is shaking dust off of your shoulder, getting out of the grave physically, but you're made of new stuff. You're not made of flesh and blood because that's perishable. That, that mm. goes away, that degrades. And Paul says, what is perishable cannot inherit that, that which is imperishable. What's imperishable? The eternal kingdom of God. God makes a new heavens and a new earth at the end of days. We're going back to eschatology now. And this goes back to the Old Testament. This is Isaiah 65 and 66, or it's Daniel chapter 12, where this is, there's this idea of a, a new heaven and new earth. We're in some sort of new epoch. And Daniel talks about physical resurrection, that mm -hmm. those who sleep in the dust of the earth will arise, some to everlasting life and some to, some to everlasting abhorrence. And even in that, the word for abhorrence, da'aron in, in Hebrew, is taken from the same word in Isaiah, at the end of Isaiah. So all these biblical writers are building on each other in this. And the New Testament, again, inherits this idea. So when, when you're raised from the dead, you are there. It's physical. It's not a metaphor. It's not a literary device. It's not a joke. It's not a, a parody. It's, it's not a not a ghost. Not a exactly not a ghost. Yeah. Right. We are talking about physicality. It's just that what is physical is made of different stuff. It's made of spirit rather than flesh. New Testament readers will be very familiar with, say, the Pauline bifurcation between. Spirit, pneuma, and flesh, sarks in Greek. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what behind that is the idea of flesh, our bone and blood that we're made of now, dies and is perishable. Then when you're raised from the dead, you have your same body, but it's like supercharged. It's made of, it's made <laughs> it's of like spirit awesome stuff. One. 
exactly. <laughs> that never dies. So right. it's made of spirit stuff. So in the ancient world, particularly in Greek thought, um, but also you get some of this in Second Temple Judaism, is that uh, spirit, okay, is a material. So it's not just like, you can't like, it's not like a wisp, you know, or a floaty thing, like a cloud. It is stuff. So for example, in John chapter 4, 24, when Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman at the well, he says famously, God is spirit. And most readers today will take that to mean, well, that means God's not a physical entity, right? God has no body, for example. That's not what it means. <laughs> what, it, what it means is, is that God's body is not made of flesh and blood like our body is. God is God's body is made of spirit stuff, just like Jesus's body, resurrection body is made of spirit stuff. But it's not an abstract body of God or of Jesus. It's real. It's physical. It moves in space. It goes from mm -hmm. point A to point B, you know? Uh, so it's a real body. It's physical. And yet it's spirit. So instead of talking in terms of how do we understand Jesus's you know, resurrection, do we understand it uh, physically or metaphorically? A better way to look at it is do we think of it in terms of flesh or of spirit? Because it's all physical and literal. It's just the question is, what's the body made out of? How do we understand that physical body? Uh, last thing I'll say on this, just to link it back to Jonah, right? So what do you do? Jesus says, just like Jonah was in the fish, so I'm going to be in the grave and I'm going to come out of the grave just like Jonah came out of the fish. Um, it doesn't mean that you need to take Jonah 100% historically. You can also take Jesus' resurrection 100% historically. Um, so for instance, like I just got back from Italy. Uh, it was a wonderful trip. And we did a lot of traveling around Italy. My wife is Italian. And we, we visited her family in one part of the country and then hung out in different parts of the country. So I could have done that big trip, you know, and come back home and said to my wife, you know, gosh, I feel like Odysseus, you know, after mm -hmm. that big, long trip. Mm -hmm. So this is right, the main character of the Odyssey who goes on a big, right. long trip. That's mm -hmm. the whole point. Now, do I think Odysseus, I mean, Odysseus may have existed historically in some form, but the narrative built around Odysseus, sure. right? Homer's narrative is fantastical and wild and theological and literary. It's beautiful, just like Jonah. So that is the, the building out of the, of the historical Jonah, if you want, is for a purpose. It's for comedy. It's for parody. It's for theology. It's for didacticism, teaching us something. But we don't need to take it 100% historically. Um, so that is, Jesus could refer to Jonah in a similar way as I just referred to Odysseus. Mm -hmm. Because in, in the narrative, it is in the narrative. It's in his data set. It's in the scriptures that he holds as like the animating force of his entire life. So why not refer to Jonah in trying to describe this thing that's going to be truthful and historical and physical, but why not use the Jonah story to illustrate it? Because both what, when Jonah goes into the fish and comes out, God's making a statement. When Jesus dies, it goes into the ground and comes out. God's making a statement. That is both events are theological and you can happily within the bounds of good Christian thought, take Jonah as say literary and Jesus's resurrection as historical. Yeah, it's not, I think this is all really helpful, Nick. I think I would say you don't, it's not an all or nothing thing, right? With scripture, like you don't have to believe everything literally historically in order to accept the literal historical bodily resurrection of Jesus, right? Like, it, that's and, right. And Jonah is a good example. I completely agree with you, right? It, 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 when you read it, especially when you read it in the Hebrew, but but also you can get this in English. It is kind of a, it's a, it's like a parody. It's this story that's meant to evoke laughter. It's humorous um, and meant to make one think about how does God deal with my enemy, right? What does God think about my enemy? So exactly. it's again, to our, to the person who sent in this great question, you don't have to take Jonah literally in order to take the resurrection literally, right? There, That's right. It, there are yeah. different genres in scripture. There are different expectations in scripture. But the point being, as you said, Nick, the gospel writers take Jesus. That It's not a vision. It's not a, right, the resurrection. It's not a metaphor. Uh, they mean us to take it very literally. Absolutely. That's right. It, I mean, resur bodily resurrection is, I would say, the fundamental belief 
of not only the New Testament, but of later Judaism, what's called rabbinic Judaism. Mm -hmm. uh, so the later rabbis, the Jewish sages who lived after Jesus, also take physical resurrection just as seriously. And so for, and the belief is both in Christianity, quote unquote, and rabbinic Judaism, is that ultimately there's going to be a universal resurrection of the dead. Right. And that goes back to Daniel, where everybody is going to shake the dust off their shoulders and be judged by God at the end of days. And, and so Jesus' resurrection has to be physical and literal if we are to follow in those footsteps and our resurrection be something more than metaphor. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how a metaphorical resurrection would help anybody. Um, right. To sure, be frank. Right. right. Uh, so yeah, but but again, and to go back to your point, Catherine, about Jonah, just really briefly, um, there are differences that the um, the biblical the gospel writers uh, would would say exist between Jonah and Jesus as people. So that as it's not sure. always a one to one comparative. Right. Jonah is doing stuff wrong. Right. Good prophets. Yeah. Don't, don't do, do what that. Jonah does. <laughs> you know, kum, lech, get up yeah. and go to Jonah. And he immediately goes in the opposite direction. But Elijah, God says, kum, lech, get up. And he immediately goes. So Jonah's right. doing the bad thing. So certainly Matthew and the other Luke and these other gospel writers aren't equating everything Jonah did and said or the person of Jonah with everything Jesus did and said. That's way too strict an understanding. So the same can be true of the precise uh, you know, presentation of Jonah's swallowing by the by the fish and coming out of the fish, and Jesus's precise death and resurrection, like they're not one to ones. So the, the, even the gospel writers are not making that point. Right. right. Yeah, and i i would I would add just this thought. You know, um, understanding like what the writers of the the various books in scripture are trying to do is really important. So it, it's not. Um, special pleading the book of jonah itself wants to be read literarily exactly the gospels want to be read historically yeah the psalms want to be read poetically and yep. liturgically yep. right and so it's actually taking i think it's taking the text much more seriously not mm -hmm. to superimpose this like is it literal metaphorical that's that's a very modern way of looking at it that's not how historically people read the scripture or the people who wrote the scripture what they were trying to do when they were right they were not trying to write yep. a science textbook or you know what i mean like yeah so absolutely. so yeah. It, it's actually in my mind it takes the text more seriously yep to try to understand what it's actually trying to do uh than to you know assume that we have to um you know if Jonah didn't get swallowed by a whale, then Jesus didn't yeah. rise from the dead. Those are not, that's not necessary. That Those are completely different questions, completely different liter literature that is trying to do completely different things. That Absolutely right. Yeah, that's right. I, I, the, Katie, what you said about taking the, the text more seriously, I think that's really, really important. Sometimes we think in terms of, okay, like the, if, uh, my Christian walk should be dictated by my ability to believe, you know, believe beyond belief. Like if I close my mm -hmm. eyes, you know, I believe, believe, believe that all these things happened historically, but there's a better, better way, a healthier way actually to approach the Bible. And that is to understand the text and what it's doing and to have your, put your trust, your, right, your faith in, in that, you know? Um, and so sometimes we take what the Bible is trying to tell us. And as you say, superimpose our own understanding of what we think the Bible's saying or wanting us to hear, um, but the key is for let to let the wave wash over us, not yes. the other way around. Right. I often say in churches when I'm teaching, you know, like if you're if in the ocean and a big wave comes up, you've got two options. One, you can dig your heels in, and then the wave is going to hit you and probably knock your teeth out because it's much stronger than you <laughs> right. are. Yeah. That's bad. You don't want that. Don't do or that. you can go loose and let the wave take you where it's going to take you, and then you'll be safe. It'll cough you up on on the shore, hopefully, rather than dragging you out. But the point is, <laughs> that's that's how we should understand. We moderns, Christian or not, need to understand that that's how we should be interpreting the Bible and understand the Bible. We need the wave of the Bible to hit us and allow us to tell, tell us what it wants to say. It's a living document. We don't have the right to dig our heels in and say, this is exactly what should be understood about the Bible or interpreted about the Bible every yeah. single time. Yep. I like that. Preach I like it. that analogy. Preach it. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
I think uh, to go back to resurrection just briefly, uh, I, I appreciate your distinguishing between spirit and flesh, but also saying spirit isn't what we moderns think of it, right? That there is a reality, a, a spatial even reality about spirit when Paul talks about that, that in 1 Corinthians 15. And I just want to say to the listener who sent this in uh, or to the others listening to this, if you don't understand that, it's okay, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> like Paul, yeah, join if, the you, club. if you want to read more, right? First Corinthians 15, Paul speaks about the resurrection and compares it, one analogy he uses is a seed, right? That is planted and then how is the seed related to the, you know, the tree or the plant that comes out of it? Well, it's 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 consistent with it, right? The tree comes from the seed, but it's not the same stuff exactly, right? So it it's a mystery, but what we what we hold as a foundational belief as Christians is that the resurrection happened historically, literally, you know, uh, physically, um, uh, and that and that that is the that as as Paul says, right? Christ's resurrection is the first fruits of those of 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 the promise of resurrection, right? That just as Christ has been raised, we also will be raised. So. Whether we understand exactly what Paul means by spirit and flesh or what kind of body it is, uh, I think we hold to that promise, right? That, that, that the resurrection of Christ uh, uh, happened the, historically, literally, physically, and that we too are promised that resurrection at the end of time. That's right. Yeah. Very well put, Catherine. Um, I completely agree. That's th- across the biblical narrative, that's the message. Uh, you know, the, the idea that, you know, when you die, your your body doesn't matter anymore and like you've got an abstract soul or something right. that floats right. up to heaven and gets a halo and wings and lives in the clouds. That That's simply- It plays a harp. It's not it biblical. It plays a harp. It's not, yeah, it's not yeah. a biblical idea because it, it right. takes out- Because, for instance, if that were true and you're already in heaven wisping around with God or whatever, then what would be the point of physical resurrection? You got to go back down into your body, you know? It's just simply not the the view. Um, If you want to just briefly a couple quick biblical references to, you know, the idea of death and then having a body after death, you take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 28, which is the medium at Endor, the woman at Endor. Oh, yeah. And we have, we have a podcast on that. So Good. We'll All right. So I won't, go, I won't go too de- yeah. deep even that. But but Samuel is gets out from the realm of the dead. He's embodied. He's got his little robe on that his mom made him as a child. And that's <laughs> and that's how Saul realizes. In Hebrew, it's me'il. That's how Saul realizes it's Samuel. Samuel has a body. Or in um, Luke chapter 16 with the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man who's bad during his life, he goes into one part of... Uh, Hades, you know, and then he's talking to Abraham. And then in the bosom of Abraham, by the way, bosom means chest, the the space, the Greek word means space between your shoulders. So how about that for embodied? And they've got, <laughs> mo- they've got mouths. The, the, the rich man needs to get some water. The, the idea in Judaism, and I, I'm including the gospels and the New Testament in that frame sure. is that you die, your physical body that you have t- is in the grave, you know, that will decay. And then there's a realm of the dead where you are embodied, and one day you're going to be pulled out of that, and that, and then your body's going to be the spirit body that's no less embodied than the one that you had, and it's going to be you when it comes out of the ground. So that's kind of the view, just to try to put some legs on the whole, this yeah. idea of spirit versus flesh, which is kind of hard to understand. Yeah. And one of, one of the things that the doctrine of the resurrection or the belief in resurrection helps me with is to, to guard against an overly spiritualized um, kind of Gnostic understanding of faith, right? That God cares about <laughs> bodies, right? God cares about uh, flesh and blood, uh, and uh, and and cares about uh, soil, and cares about water, and cares about air, right? Absolutely. I mean, God creates it all. God becomes flesh and blood, uh, mm-hmm. and God Good. resurrects uh, bodies, right? So, I, I just think that. It it fits right. It fits with what we know of God from both uh, Hebrew scripture testimony, Jewish testimony, and uh, and from the New Testament as well. Yeah, well put. Well, thank you so much, Nick, for uh, uh, talking about this great question, uh, and uh, we really appreciate your your input and your insights so much. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, that was, My that was pleasure. wonderful. My pleasure. Yeah, it was great to see you both. 
Yeah. And uh, thank you to our listeners uh, and our viewers for uh, listening to this uh, episode of the Enter the Bible podcast. Uh, Please go to Enter the Bible, submit your questions, uh, review and rate uh, this podcast, recommend it to a friend. And uh, we look forward to uh, talking to you next time. Take care.